Welcome to our webinar. Today, we're going to be exploring the topic of simulating ransomware to test and validate security controls and response strategies. Uh, during the webinar today, we're going to talk about various types of ransomware and what you can do to protect your business, but also how you can safely and regularly test and validate your security controls by simulating real world attacks in your environment. Our presenters today are myself, Ronan Lavelle, and my colleague, Andrew Brown. And we're from a company called Elasticito. Uh, we specialize in automated offensive security testing programs and cyber risk uh, management. A Little bit of housekeeping, the webinar today will be recorded and we will send you uh, a link to the recording uh, after the session. You can share that with your colleagues and friends and network if you wish as well. Um, we also encourage any questions from you, and if it's okay with you, we will answer those questions at the end of the session. But within your Zoom console, uh, you will see a Q&A button. Uh, please type your questions there as they come into your head. Please try and avoid using the chat, um, however, excuse me, um, because the chats are visible in the recording of this session. So please use the Q&A button if you, uh, if you can find that. Right, uh, to start off, um, the first thing to point out, and I have to thank our um, peers at Sophos uh, for some of the data that we're gonna show uh, in today's uh, session. Um, Sophos is the annual report uh, around um, the state of ransomware, uh, basically shows that this problem and issue is not really going away. And roughly half of all organizations on an annual basis are still getting hit uh, by disruptive and damaging ransomware attacks. Um, and obviously just in 2020, uh, we've seen some pretty huge examples of this. These are just a small subset on the screen, but even um, just in the last 12, 24 hours, we've seen a high priority alert being issued by the FBI um, alerting US healthcare system organizations of an imminent planned attack around this, uh, this area. Um, and the large Italian energy company, NL, has been hit by, uh, by a ransomware attack for the second time uh, in recent months. So um, one of the key points here is that when we hear about these kind of attacks, um, it's only because those companies either have to or want to share that. Um, and there is some research that would show that uh, a large proportion of companies don't publicly disclose these kind of attacks. So the issue could be worse than, uh, than we publicly know about as well. Um, and as the, uh, the SOFOS research shows, um, we're talking about a huge proportion of companies anyway, almost 50% of all organizations are hit by this. So by looking at how industries are targeted is useful, but actually not that useful because uh, we're still looking at a range from 45% to 60%. So, but uh, you know, le leisure, media, entertainment is obviously the, the most hit along with services and telecom and technology companies. Uh, but as you see with you know, companies like NL, uh, energy, gas, utilities as well. And these remain very expensive uh, incidents to uh, resolve, not just in terms of the, uh, the ransom payments, but also if they're made, in fact, uh, but also the, uh, the recovery afterwards. And we've seen some fairly uh, eye-opening examples just within 2020 of companies that um, thought they had paid the ransom and that they were okay, but then they found that they were not. Um, we've seen um, threat actors um, issuing ransoms, but also uh, exfiltrating data. So um, even if you think you can't pay the ransom or you don't want to pay the ransom or you have paid it, uh, you still need to recover your data as well. Um, and we see in some countries, it's much more expensive than in other countries to resolve uh, the issue of ransomware uh, attacks. So in Sweden, Japan, Australia, for instance, it's extremely expensive. Um, read the detail behind the SOFOS report, um, it would indicate that's mainly because their cost of uh, human resources are much higher in those countries than in uh, some of the lower cost countries. But still around three quarters of a million dollars per attack and incident uh, to resolve. 
um, and as a provider of technology services in this space, I would dearly love anyone on today's webinar to give me $700,000, but it's going to be a very big ask uh, for most companies. Um, and yet that is what we're looking at on a per attack basis with ransomware. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to run a very quick poll. Um, uh, and the question is, does your business have a response strategy in place to deal with ransomware attacks? This is something we're going to talk about on today's webinar. Um, and I want to make sure that um, um, you uh, are able to answer this in, in the most uh, free way. So this is completely anonymous. We don't capture any data about who is answering. Many thanks for that. I'll give another few seconds just while there are people completing that. Okay, so if we just share those results, um, just over half of you have plans in place, um, uh, but quite naturally, a lot of people do not want to say either. Um, okay, thank you for that. Uh, very useful. Um, I'm going to hand the screen over to my colleague, Andrew, who's going to go through um, the various different types of ransomware that we are typically find in the marketplace, what you can do to rem remedy and to um, protect your organizations. But then we're also going to show you uh, how you shouldn't just rely on those protections and those security controls and think that you're OK, uh, because we're also going to then help you to verify and validate uh, that those controls are doing the job that you think they need to be doing for you uh, through attack simulations. So, Andrew. Brennan, thank you. So, uh, what I'd like to do uh, during the course of today's webinar is, is provide you with, I think, a set of tools and um, some guidelines on, on what you can do around ransomware. Um, it's, it's very contextual, as you'll see from uh, what we're uh, going to go through. And by contextual, I mean relevant to your organization. Ransomware has become a lot more targeted um, from the point of view of the threat actors are looking at organizations deciding who they think they can extract money from, and then going after those organizations in quite a specific way. So to begin with, um, things that we uh, probably have all seen before, but I'd just like to put them out there, is I'm going to uh, make use of NIST uh, and the NIST cybersecurity framework from the point of view of identifying things like crown jewels. In this case, what's our crown jewels? It will be our endpoint, it will be our data, it will be um, you know where we've actually got uh, our data residing. So it could be actually be a cloud resource, um, even a SaaS type environment. And what we're interested in understanding is, is um, what protection do we have? Does that protection work? Can we actually turn that protection on? Um, are we getting visibility and are we doing some detection around the exercise and does that work? And finally, what is our response and are we uh, practicing that response so it's more sort of you know a lot more orderly and and lastly you know how do we recover from something like this what should we make sure that we're actually doing around uh, recovering uh, should this actually take place um, moving on from that, um, some of the other things that we need to uh, look at, um, uh, maybe not everybody would be familiar with this, but if we look at MITRE ATT&CK, MITRE ATT&CK has, uh, and we'll, use it, we'll mention this quite a lot, they have compiled a complete taxonomy um, that describes different type of adversarial groups and their associated behavior. And behavior is a big thing that I'm gonna go into today. Um, just to understand sort of behavior and give a descriptor around it. Think of, you know, a safe and someone uh, breaking into a safe. And we've all seen in the movies, someone with a stethoscope, you know, up against the safe door, turning the tumbler, okay, and listening to the dials click into place. Well, if we change that um, a lock on the actual safe door to a digital uh, 
uh, one, then that expert safe cracker, we've completely foiled their behavior and their modus operandi. And that's what we're looking at today. To be effective against a ransomware attack, we need to understand the tactics, techniques, and procedure of our adversary, and we need to defeat their behavior. We can't work on IOCs and signatures. Otherwise, um, you know, uh, we're never going to actually make progress against this. So hence the reason of bringing up MITRE ATT&CK. Um, your whole uh, exercise around this needs to start off with some research. And what I've got here is um, everything that we've put in today, there might be one or two things that, you know, we haven't included. Um, this is meant to be more uh, a, a do-it-yourself, get out there and guide you in the right direction. So um, it's not a, a comprehensive step-by-step -step guide. So my suggestion is you need to start off doing some research around this. Um, one, understanding the different types of ransomware attacks. There's a lot of good information out there uh, on the internet about it. There's a lot being written about uh, ransomware and uh, different attacks. And you need to understand, okay, what, could, what, what are they? What could uh, affect my business and, and what's relevant to me? Then the next one that um, I, I think, you know, uh, it bears a lot of consideration here is who is first likely to report a ransomware incident and where are we likely to see it? Um, I don't think, okay, um, that necessarily the SOC or the SEAM is going to be the first place that you're going to see this. Um, it could very well be that, but you have to look at how long does it take an event to propagate if an event actually does propagate. Most certainly, possibly the first person who's going to see this is the end user that triggers this ransomware um, on their actual endpoint, unless there's a delayed uh, mechanism put into it. In, in which case, who's going to be the first responder? What is that end user going to do? Do they know what to do if they, you know, trigger ransomware? Are they going to, you know, be too petrified to phone anybody and just decide to go home uh, and leave the building or, you know, shut down their endpoint if they're working from home? Or are they going to call the call center? And in each case, if they call the call center, we now start ending up with a first responder as our IT call center, or maybe it's even an outsource company do they have clear and concise instructions as to exactly what to do? And those instructions need to take, case, uh, take place of sort of any scenario. They need to be relatively simple, easy to follow, okay? And we need to work out what that first responder is then going to do. So need to extract the information from the end user and then pass it on to, you know, whoever's going to do various things within the organization organization, which is all part of putting together this uh, response plan. Um, we also need to understand, okay, um, what disruption and damage the ransomware is likely to cause and to where, and how will I recover my data and my systems for business continuity? Does that all work? So those are just the main research points that I'm suggesting or putting out there. Um, there could be some more, but uh, feel free uh, to add to these uh, research points. Um, moving on, if we look at it, I put this down into four main categories of ransomware, and the top two I'm going to deal with uh, relatively quickly. Um, the first one is um, remote desktop access, uh, and I'll drill into that a little bit more. If we then look at it, um, I'm sure we all know that uh, USB and removable media like flash drives can most certainly be a source of, um, uh, you know, that uh, there's lots of trips going around, okay, with people sort of dropping USB sticks and having confidential things written on it and it's the curious mind and then we have the phishing email attachments etc etc and I'll drill down into some uh, awareness training and you know what you can look at around there and then drive by downloads from a compromised website that is it sort of at a high level overview of, of what we have around ransomware um, moving on, why is um, remote desktop uh, such a big issue? Well, 
if we look at it, okay, um, and look at the stats that we've got on the side here, and we look at the top places this is, these are created or it's actually happening, um, this is very obviously people going along and um, they may not have the skill, they may not have the understanding, the knowledge, or the realization about what the consequences are of their action, but it's very easy to go into AWS Azure GCP and stand up a, um, a window Windows uh, machine in their Windows server and turn around and say, hmm, I need to manage this from my desktop. I've got a Windows desktop. I'm going to manage it via, um, uh, you know, remote desktop protocol. So all I did was I went to the showdown, I put in a very simple command, and I said, give me a list of all of the machines that are publicly facing that have remote desktop uh, protocol enabled. And I got a sample of 3.6 million, which is a great place to start. Um, and what's happening in this case, okay, is um, uh, it's being brute forced uh, because two-factor authentication is not enabled. You get a list of which organizations it has so I can refine my showdown uh, query. So it's a great place to start. So one of the things that you might want to do for your organization is have a look at your digital footprint. There's a lot of good tools out there to build digital footprints and understand, is there anything out there associated with my organization where we happen to have a, a remote desktop protocol open? And that's really, you know, uh, quite simple to uh, remediate around that. There's plenty of other solutions around uh, uh, managing a machine uh, remotely. And I would suggest you uh, follow down that path. And one of the things is also enable uh, two-factor or multi-factor authentication around that. Um, USB and removable media, media uh, within an organization. Um, this we now start getting into business needs certain things and ease of doing business. Um, uh, and I'm not suggesting this, this is the ultimate, um, you know, fix all to it, but one of the fixes to be able to do it, disable auto run on your actual uh, endpoints, um, disable USB flash drive access. There are various means and ways to be able to go out and uh, do that. And again, test and verify. Test and verify is so important. You think you've done it, you think you've got it right, but there's nothing better than actually checking. You know, even with harmless uh, type known uh, uh, executables and, and what you're looking at being able to access out there. Um, you know, fileless can come in the form of PDF files. Well, that, that's fine. We just want to make sure you can't access the, the USB drive uh, out there. If business needs it, um, you know, I'm not suggesting we disable business, but then we need to come up with uh, and, and do some more thinking around this exercise. Um, we now get into a lot more challenging uh, area around this, and, and that is phishing emails. And one thing I'd like to, to cover off in this exercise, I probably mentioned it further down in my um, presentation, is user awareness training. Yes, I'm a great believer in user awareness training, okay? But I believe it is perfectly possible to fool any user out there. And I'm gonna talk about one of the ways that, that, that we could look at doing this and what we're actually seeing happen around this exercise. Phishing emails don't necessarily just take the um, path of from an external source coming into your actual environment um, to sort of a high risk area like a call center or HR who have to take unsolicited emails or maybe, you know, someone like uh, finance and we uh, purport to be from HMRC and say, you know, uh, send the uh, CEFO uh, a tax demand or VAT demand from HMRC, you know, that will encourage people to actually open those things. Can I get past your, your email gateway? Absolutely, it doesn't matter what it is. The stats are out there and I'll quite happily um, share with anybody uh, uh, links to where those stats are. At least out of every 100 malicious emails, 10% are going to get passed. They're going to get into an organization. But what we're seeing more of now within organizations is uh, companies having moved over to things like Office 365, cloud email type environments, and those are being complicated 
compromised via leak credentials, via phishing the credentials. So now what we have is uh, our threat actor purporting to be someone from let's say HR uh, within the organization using that email address and uh, then distributing phishing emails, attachments or links uh, within the organization uh, that way around. So what we're busy looking at here is turning around and saying, okay, sure, you need to have your normal content rules that things like no executable files and stuff like that. But we need to be able to turn around and we don't know when this ransomware attack happens necessarily where it came from or what it is. And in which case we need what I've put down as a set of first responder rules, okay, whereby we turn around and say, okay, we want email up and running. We don't want to have to shut it down, but how's it going to work safely? Well, no links, no attachments, full stop. And that's both inbound, outbound. And this is a challenge a lot of companies face internal, okay? Uh, ransomware can move laterally through your organization using, um, you know, um, uh, email. And I've just mentioned that's in a way how it could have got in first of all, because of a compromised uh, Office 365 account, okay, that's moving laterally internally and it's bypassed things like secure email gateways. Again, these rules and the things that you need to do need to be tested and verified and they need to be readily available for someone to easily press the button on and say, right, we, we've detected ransomware, we're gonna go into this, you know, enhanced state of, of lockdown really, um, until we've, we've got a better handle on what's going on. But we're still enabling business to operate, we can still communicate, we can still communicate with our, our clients, our vendors and the business, just sorry, no links and attachments right at this moment in time. Um, if we move on, and, and I'm going to take a little bit from the last bit because I didn't talk about links necessarily, but this also comes to, you know, drive-by downloads from compromised websites. Uh, this is something whereby we need to uh, look at how do we stop um, compromised websites. Any website out there could end up compromised, um, and there's been some good known examples. So really, um, short of banning links, which is not necessarily conducive to actually business happening, we need something like a secure web gateway. Um, AV AI scanners, yes, they're useful, okay. Um, one of the most effective solutions I, I've seen out there is where um, you only use uh, whitelisting. Uh, so you can only go to uh, sites that have been whitelisted and I'm not suggesting you build your own whitelist. There's a lot of good content um, uh, solutions out there that do uh, whitelisting and have a really large list of whitelisting links. Again, you need to test and verify this and it's a case of uh, you need to be really, really strict on what can and what cannot happen out there and maybe have a uh, much smaller, more restrictive type list should a ransomware attack um, uh, be taking place. The reason for this is, is we want to contain it, but we don't want to, as far as we possibly can, shut the business down. We want the business to be carry on operating while we actually resolve this actual issue. And again, this is where test and verify comes in. We can do all the things in the world that we like, you know, but we need to test and check has our assumptions and everything that we thought about actually, uh, you know, do they work when we're actually, uh, our first responders are dealing with this and we're needing to, you know, implement some emergency procedures. And has business signed off on this? Are businesses aware and bought into why we're doing this? So um, if we look at our, our endpoint, um, a couple of things that we, we can look at around our endpoint, um, uh, that we need to sort of know about. Earlier forms of ransomware came in the forms of an executable file, um, trigger that on your endpoint and away the ransomware goes. So um, if you had a Mac, you could enable, you know, any apps from the Mac store on Windows, the naming sort of changes on a regular basis, but there are various ways on a Windows endpoint to disable uh, unknown executables from triggering uh, on that endpoint. Again, we're focusing very much here on behavioral based. So it's case if you're an executable and I don't know about you, we're not letting you trigger. 
Um, then there's obviously your EDR, AVI, um, I'm sorry, AI, uh, AV scanners that, that could be there. Um, again, looking at behavioral type based, not necessarily just signature. And then one of the most effective things that I happen to have seen out there is using micro virtualization technology. This is really around known good. It doesn't care, okay, what it is. When you open a file, a web page, or whatever, it pops it into a micro VM. If the ransomware explodes, it explodes in there and it cannot, cannot go anywhere. Anywhere. Um, I've mentioned in Unis uh, awareness training, but in here, we need to understand, are we able to do an image restore on our endpoint? Um, is that going to work? And if so, how quickly? Uh, we need to be able to practice it. We need to be able to check that it actually works. And we also need to look at other things in our environment. And depending on an organization, and we might look more longer term strategy, um, ransomware has moved more into the fileless type category. Why? Because of things that I've mentioned on point one here. So if we look at uh, doing some uh, slightly more different things in our organization, using things like Chromebooks, using things like Linux endpoint, using things like SaaS applications, like uh, moving across to and using maybe G Suite, um, using uh, uh, cloud applications around it. Uh, a lot of the files uh, list stuff is is more uh, web shell, it's more focused on Microsoft. Um, why? Because Microsoft's got a huge base out there. I, I, so in no way am I pointing anything at, at, at Microsoft. It's just these are alternatives that you can look at to make yourself less susceptible to um, you know, a ransomware uh, attack within your organization. How are we doing on the slides there, Renan? Right, uh, last thing, um, network, okay. Uh, we need to understand about uh, things like network shares. Um, under network shares, uh, I'd, I'd like to include things like, you know, if someone's put a link through to bot, decided that box can be used or Dropbox, or, um, you know, you're using a, a shared uh, G Suite environment on a, a Windows machine. Um, all of those type of things, uh, while very nice and easy, okay, enables the sharing of files uh, easily between different environments uh, lead to, you know, your data being encrypted. We also see lateral movement, and as Ronan mentioned, exfiltration of data. Ransomwares can move laterally. They can exploit vulnerabilities. So one of the things is looking at segmentation. And when I say segmentation, most certainly things like data centers and publicly facing data centers. So if you happen to be an organization and the public make use of your data centers, make sure that those happen to be well, well segmented from uh, your actual normal user environment. And if there are certain users that need access to those environments, you might want to look at chopping off that access or removing that access Access should a ransomware attack take place, uh, enabling certain or, uh, parts of the data center to completely carry on functioning while this is actually uh, in place. Again, need to be tested, tried, backups need to be verified. So again, all different pointers around what you can look at, what you can test. And as I said, the list that I've put together and what we put together here is, is not trying to be you know, a, a comprehensive checklist here, but more of a guide and some ideas is to take you down the road of things that you need to investigate and you might have to have sort of a staged approach to this as you improve and you know it could be quarterly six months even a year as you move down the road of improving your organization and reorganizing and doing things like segmentation etc cetera, etc cetera. so a um, little bit of note uh, and the reason I'm, I'm going on to this is is uh, just to get rid of sort of any confusion, we're going to move into sort of the breach and attack simulation tools. Um, pen testing, um, which a lot of organizations turn around and say, oh, well, we've done a pen test. Um, pen test isn't going to answer the questions around 
um, ransomware and what a ransomware is going to do in your organization. Um, you need to have a look to be able to do the testing and the verifying around here for something like a breach and attack simulation tool. Um, there's some open tool, source tools out there. there. There's plenty of tools, commercial and open source, that you can use to be able to uh, do what we're, we're about to do. Uh, MITRE is a great source of, of knowledge and associated stuff to do with that around how to approach this type of exercise. Okay, so I'm going to switch the screen, now, Andrew, if it's okay, because uh, we're going to show um, the the live interface from your machine. Um, just to answer the question that was put on the uh, the chat a few moments ago, um, yes, today's session is being recorded, and we will also send the slides uh, to everyone as well. Um, and again, if you have any questions that you'd like us to answer, please don't use the chat, but use the Q&A button, and we will uh, answer those at the um, at the end of the session. Okay, Andrew. Thanks, Ryan. So, um, the tool that I'm busy using today um, is, is Safe Breach. It's a breach and attack tool. Um, the reason I'm using this is really to demonstrate the concept. You're welcome to do this whichever way around you want to do it. Uh, What's important here when I have a look at this and I start doing my actual testing is to decide for yourself whether you believe you have a representative sample of um, ransomware that's not going to do harm. So this is, um, you know, the sample and the stuff that I'm doing here will trigger the security controls, but it will in no way do any damage to the actual environment, okay? And I'm looking for a number of things here. I'm looking to understand my protection, and it's not just my normal protection, it's also my emergency protection that I happen to have, my emergency rules, okay? Um, so that's uh, part one. I'm looking to see whether we've got behavior uh, and that it's working behaviorally rather than, uh, you know, on a specific cases of actual ransomware or IOCs. And I also want to see, is my detection working? Am I seeing events? Am I seeing enough events and getting enough visibility so I can trace back and find out possibly where this is? Because if I've had ransomware come into my organization via email, I might then need to say, well, who did it go to? Where did it come from? What was the source? And I might have to be going and removing this out of my actual uh, you know, environment and my server and my mail store, et cetera, et cetera. So again, part of the you know, first responder or, or actions, how do we go and investigate this? Where do we go looking for it? What is the standard procedure we run through to look at where or diagnose where it came in from, what it's actually doing and what effect it's gonna have on our organization. So I got a representative sample, or I think a representative sample here. I can test this, whether it can move laterally uh, through our organization, also via email, um, you know, uh, and, and that's very important that you, uh, I see a lot of companies look at content solutions for inbound, okay, and maybe to stop stuff leaking outbound, but I hear very, very few organizations talk about content and being able to filter out content to move laterally or within the actual organization. And it, it's, it's the easiest way for an attacker to actually do this type of ransomware because all security controls are suddenly bypassed. Um, so we've got some stuff around infiltration, we can test the web gateway here, we can test the email gateway, and then we've got some host level stuff here, both um, from the point of view of file lists, and we've also got um, normal ransomware to understand, you know, what is going to happen in my environment, um, is my operating system and the settings that I put on my group policy going to stop it happening, um, is my endpoint then going to uh, kick in and look at it uh, from a behavioral perspective and am I going to get events associated with it? So that's what I'd mention here is, is to when you're going to use something like this uh, and use a tool that you have, first question, is it representative? Is it able to uh, uh, do all my scenarios? And you know, then uh, I might have to use a couple of tools to be able to test this type of thing. Um, 
Moving on, and, and I want to just talk a bit more about configuration when we do this exercise and talking about setting up sort of uh, simulations or attacks. If we're going to do an attack of a target email account and I am doing this externally, I need to be a little bit careful of the account that I use as an attacker account. And the reason for that is if I use that, say, a, a, a just a standard Gmail account because easy to get hold of as my actual attacker account, there is a very good possibility that my attacker account is going to kill everything off before it physically leaves that mail environment. So I really want to be able to sort of get a very raw uh, email account from sort of an ISP out there uh, that allows me to uh, have absolutely zero filtering on my outbound solution, okay, and, um, you know, to be able to do that. Be aware, though, that this could also have some adverse effect. If you are targeting things like um, uh, Gmail uh, or Microsoft uh, uh, the environments or certain other mail environments, uh, there is a possibility if you start uh, sending out large quantities of malware ransomware that things like Google and Microsoft block the IP that you're actually sending it from. So just be uh, a little bit aware of, of the effects of what you're doing here. Um, but this type of configuration where you happen to have an attacker and a target enables you to also uh, send inbound, it enables you to move it laterally and it enables you to send outbound, hence testing all of your content rules, um, which was the plan that we needed to do in the first place. Um, looking at results and what we need around results, um, and what we want around results is a couple of things. So I'm um, just waiting for this to load up here. Um, what we're really interested in, uh, and again, I'm just gonna look at uh, ransomware uh, in general uh, around this exercise and results that we happen to have in the demonstration platform around here. Couple of things that I'm interested in. First off, I'm interested in, um, did we actually uh, block or did we not block? That is our protection. And I'd be interested in looking at this and saying, okay, let's list everything that was not blocked and um, we can look at it from an email perspective and understand, okay, where have we got it on the email? And what I want to understand here is, is I, have I got a behavioral issue? Am I not, uh, uh, am I picking up some of it? Am I picking up others of it? Am I detecting this as an IOC or am, am I detecting it behaviorally? Or is there an issue with my rule set that I happen to have? And one very easy way to do that is, is map across to MITRE and go and have a look at MITRE over here, okay, and this says, okay, we didn't block any of this exercise, so this says to me, this is a behavioral issue that we've got. If we blocked half of it and not the other half, that means that we were then doing the detection on an IOC type basis rather than a behavioral basis. So um, that, that's important to look at from that type of perspective over there uh, and understand what I'm seeing for the results. So it's protection. Did my protection work? Did my result, uh, 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 protection not work uh, on that exercise? The next item that I'm really interested in is did I actually detect this stuff? So when I say did I actually uh, detect it, um, let me just go back and uh, get rid of some filters over here, um, clear off all the filters. So let's go back, let's say I want to look at uh, ransomware and I want to say, what did I detect? Um, put in some ransomware. And again, you know, did I detect it? Where did I detect it? And if I look uh, again and I go into my uh, email side of it and add it around the actual email, I can see that, hey, we're not getting any information around um, detection. So I've got an e uh, issue on my email side of it uh, with regards to actual detection. So, um, and Lastly, what I'd like to uh, look at here is how do I map back uh, into MITRE and understand from a MITRE perspective my whole organization and map out my whole organization 
and understand where I happen to have the gaps in my organization. And we can quite simply see that this is the areas where I have uh, issues uh, in my organization. Um, uh, you know, for certain of my uh, assets, I'm able to stop actual encryption happening. In other cases, I'm not able to stop encryption happening. And the case of is why. What I'd also like to point out while I'm here um, is just to quickly look at things like, um, if I look at JAF ransomware, um, just so everybody is aware of this exercise, and I look at what JAF ransomware comprises of when I map it back to MITRE, that is very different from when I look at things like Maze ransomware and I look at the TTPs uh, from there, as opposed to one of our other favorites out here, which happens to be WannaCry. Be aware that you know different types of ransomware have different um, TTPs associated with them. And like I said, you need to make sure that you have uh, all of this covered within your environment from a behavioral perspective. And very quickly, what you've seen here is we got different responses to different types of ransomware around our environment. That's because I'm sitting in a demo type environment. Um, you can take your results if you want, and you can uh, very easily and nicely use this uh, MITRE uh, attack navigator um, that MITRE's put together. Notice it's changed if you haven't been in here lately. They've just uh, 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 added pre-attack to this exercise. So we've got uh, reconnaissance and resource development uh, that have been added to the left. And if you're wondering why this looks slightly strange, it's because we've got all the sub-techniques in here as well. So useful thing here is, is you can uh, look at different types of ransomware. You can look at uh, different types of assets in different areas of your organization. And you can actually combine layers. There's a nice video we posted up to um, uh, YouTube that shows you how to combine layers. So you can actually break your test down and look at this from a, either protection, detection uh, point of view, uh, or alternatively, different areas of your organization. But what's important is to answer these questions and train. It's not only user awareness training, it's your tech team. How's your tech team going to respond to this? Who's going to be the first responders? What should they do? We don't want to start trying to figure all that out when an end user phones up and says, I've got ransomware on my machine. It's the easiest thing in the world for someone to end up with it happening, okay? Um, you know, because the, 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 the advantage is to the threat actor. They only have to be successful once and find one way into your organization and you now have an incident that you need to deal with. So um, that's really sort of from my point of view, uh, everything that I have to say on it. Um, I hope you found that useful uh, and sort of like the pointers we've given you uh, around this exercise. Uh, I'm going to hand back over to Ronan now uh, to finish off the session, but thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and uh, it was a great uh, run through of that. Um, Again, if you have any questions, uh, please do type them in the Q&A uh, section. There's a button called Q&A at the bottom of your screen, I hope, um, and you should be able to see them there. Um, there is a question from James about whether we can integrate what we just showed you with vector.io. So um, short answer is um, immediately out of the box, uh, there is no integration. Um, but I do understand that it's um, a platform for looking at purple team testing um, and observing TTP. So uh, the longer answer is uh, we will look at that. Um, the platform has a, a fully documented API um, for ingesting and exporting uh, its data. So um, I will withhold our formal answer, but uh, we'll certainly look at that. If there are any other uh, questions, again, just type them away and we're very happy to answer. And if not, um, I would just um, finish perhaps by saying that um, we hope that you found today's session um, interesting and a valuable use of your time. Um, we're more than happy to, in an 
non-sales environment to show you how attack simulations can work uh, to very independently uh, test and validate your assumptions on how you think your security controls are working today. Uh, but equally, um, uh, if you do not believe you have a very mature uh, response strategy uh, and set up to handle um, threats like ransomware, uh, we are more than happy to advise and help uh, you to uh, to build a program around this as well. Um, our contact details are on the screen. Uh, you will get a copy of these slides and as I said, the recording of today's session as well. Please do uh, socialize it amongst your, amongst your network if you found today's session useful. And otherwise I will give you 15 minutes back for your days. Thank you very much everyone and goodbye.